This morning, we're going to continue um, our journey through um, just a few Old Testament uh, prophets who had a word to bring uh, to the nation of Israel and surrounding nations as well. The thing about the, the book of Nahum, let me I just ask a question. How many of you have ever read, I mean, just casual reading, you've read the book of Nahum, just have you just picked that up? And so there's like three of us who've read this book from uh, the Old Testament. Understandable, completely understandable. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. It is just that kind of material. Uh, I totally understood. And so um, we're um, in the middle of this look um, at these uh, kind of these shreds, these, uh, these, these tatters, uh, tattered fabric uh, that uh, are found here through these three books, Joel, Nahum, and Zephaniah. I want to encourage you, uh, you can take some notes if there's something you hear that really um, kind of resonates with you, something you want to think about a little bit more in this week. Uh, you'll find note cards there in the pew in front of you. Grab one of those um, and just write down some notes. Before we get started uh, in this uh, message this morning, um, I just want to take a moment and let's just pray together. God, the fact of the matter is, while there are portions of your word that for a lot of different reasons, God, we maybe we're not as familiar with, Lord, they still carry great import. And this morning, as we take a look at this, this book, Nahum, Lord, may we, um, may we hear you speak to us in a way that's fresh and new. May we be filled with with the confidence of knowing that you are God on the throne as we read uh, what you have said to us, your people, to your people, the nation of Israel, and to the rest of the world. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. I don't know if you've ever heard the name Tim Keller, but he was the pastor of a church in Manhattan called Redeemer Presbyterian Church. And he shared a story. He said this. He said years ago, uh, he read an ad in the New York Times. And it said, the meaning of Christmas is that love will triumph and that we will be able to put together a world of unity and peace. In other words, Keller went on, we have the light within us. And so we are the ones who can dispel the darkness of the world. We can overcome poverty, injustice, violence, and evil. If we work together, we can create a world of unity and peace. Can we? Keller went on, he said, one of the most thoughtful world leaders of the late 20th century was Vaclav Havel. Uh, the first president of the Czech Republic. And he had a unique vantage point from which he could peer deeply both into socialism and capitalism. And he was not optimistic that either would by itself solve the greatest of human problems. He knew that science, unguided by moral principles, that gave us the Holocaust. He concluded that neither technology nor the state nor the market alone could save us from nuclear degradation. Havel said this, the pursuit of the good life will not help humanity save itself, nor is democracy alone enough. He went on, he said, a turning to and seeing of God is needed. The human race constantly forgets, he said, they're not God. This morning, I've got some news I want to share with you from the book of Nahum. That at first, <laughs> it's not going to feel so great. Okay, I'll just be honest. But, but here it is. The truth is, God's triumph is undeniable. Wickedness will be defeated. Tyranny cannot last. God wins, period. In our nation... We have tamed, maybe we've even sterilized God to the point that that God, little g, and the God of the Bible 
are not the same person. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, I, I get the idea of wanting to have a God who's kind of toned down to his core, okay? But folks, there's one thing that this book of Nahum communicates clearly. It's this. We get this from the book of Nahum. God is eternally and deadly serious about vengeance, justice, and righteousness. Now, I'm going to admit that's not a very comforting thought this morning, but it's true. The problem is not God's perceptions about himself, but it's our profound failure to grasp just exactly how different he is from all of us. And Nahum, the book of Nahum, there are three things that I want to pull out of that book this morning that point to specific mistakes that we often make with regard to this undeniable truth. And first, it's really, it's super easy for all of us to underestimate God's righteous anger. We heard this verse this morning. Pastor Bryce read it for us. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. I don't know about you guys. I just got to stop right there. This isn't even in my notes. I read that verse of Scripture, and I'm like, man, we're in trouble, right? I, I, I want a God who's love like 24-7, 365. <laughs> That's what I want. But then I read this. Nahum, Nahum goes on. He says, the Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger. Here's the good part, though. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. J.I. Packer, who was a, a theologian, wrote a book called Knowing God. It's a classic book. And he said this, there are more references in Scripture to the anger, fury, and wrath of God than there are to his love and tenderness. Yikes. <laughs> you know, Here's the deal. You and I, I know we may not like, like that, that this particular concept of God. We, we may be even tempted to ask, how can that God be the same God of the New Testament? Francis Chan is a pastor, and he wrote a book called Crazy Love. And he made this observation about God. He says, he, God, has to punish sin. And maybe that's not an appealing standard, but to put it bluntly, when you get your own universe, then you can make the standards. When we disagree, let's not assume it's his reasoning, God's reasoning, that needs to be corrected. And can I let you in on something else about this prophet of Nahum? He's trying to communicate to us in these next few verses something that's really critical. We're going to pick up where we left off. Pick up in verse, pick up in verse 3. Nahum's describing God. He says, his way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence. The world and all who live in it, who can withstand his indignation, who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks shatter before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into darkness. Here is the deal. God is good to those who trust him. And he's dreadful to those who don't. God is good to those who trust him. And he's dreadful to those who don't. Over and over, throughout the New Testament, actually, the Apostle Paul, he, he writes about wrath. He writes about vengeance, the, this righteous anger of God. You will read about it. If you read through the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Romans chapter 2, verse 5, Romans 5, verse 9, chapter 12, verse 19, chapter 13, verse 4, all of them explain to us that God is a God of righteous anger. 
Or maybe it's just simply that God has an anger management problem. Maybe, right? Maybe, maybe, that's, the, maybe that's the deal. Does it make you nervous? I, I know it has a tendency to make me a little nervous, for example, to read in Matthew, Luke, and Mark's gospel that Jesus kicked over market stalls that had been set up in the center place for worship of the nation of Israel. See, the difference is God's anger, his righteous anger, is motivated by one thing. And only, there's only one thing that motivates this anger. It's his righteousness. The one thing, the one thing that motivates all of that is his righteousness. And through the prophet Nahum, God is saying it's time for the guilty to be punished. That's important. Remember that. Time for the guilty to answer for what they've done. And then a few moments later on here as we kind of work through this book of Nahum, the target of God's wrath is a city. Do you remember what I said it was, what, what we read? Nineveh. It's the city of Nineveh. In essence, it's the empire of the ancient Assyria. But here's the question for you and for me. How does this truth about God's righteous anger apply to what God expects of his people today? Now, we'll get to that in a moment, the, the implications for us today. Well, we have to agree that as humans, we display a serious aversion to God's righteous anger. We also display what can best be described as an astonishing um, ignorance or even a disregard for God's absolute judgment. We, we don't like to talk about this either. It's a hard one. But Nahum chapter 2, verse 13, it further kind of clarifies the picture for us here. God says this, Assyria, I'm your enemy, says the God of the angel armies. I'll torture your chariots. They'll go up in smoke. Lion country will be strewn with carcasses. The war business is over. You, you, you're out of work. You'll have no more wars to report, no more victories to announce. You're out of war work forever. Let me explain something to you very briefly about Nahum and what he's telling this ancient nation. He's, he's already a identified the offending capital city of this great nation, Nineveh. Does that city, to those of you who maybe you've read a little bit of the Bible, does that city sound familiar at all? The city of Nineveh. It's the city that who was told to go preach? Jonah. Jonah was told to go. But what did Jonah do? He took a wrong turn on purpose and ended up as great fish food, right? But God declares himself to be the enemy of Nineveh. And this reference to lion country, if you look through your history books, you'll find something very interesting when they talk about the ancient civilization known as Assyria. That's an often seen image that's associated with that empire, the Assyrian empire. You'll find it uh, throughout uh, history books. They, they will show uh, statues and so on and so forth with the lion that represents Assyria. And again, here's the truth. We may struggle with the reality of God as judge, but over and over again in the Bible, we read God judges a few things, Adam and Eve, the world, the flood, ancient cities, Sidon, Tyre, Sodom, Gomorrah, Egypt for enslaving Israel, the wicked nations around the chosen people of Israel, the unfaithfulness of Israel itself, which led to the nation being taken into captivity as a spoil of war. But not only in the Old Testament, we also read in the New Testament about God judging. Yeah, it happens in the New Testament. Ananias and Sapphira, King Herod, for being filled with pride. And for those of us who participate in the Lord's Supper without conducting a serious moral 
internal inventory. Again, the question for us as we, we look at what it means to be part of, part, of, part of a remnant, we are part of a remnant too, faithful people to God. What does Jesus teach us? What does Jesus have to say about the finality of God's judgment? You cannot claim to have read the New Testament and not recognize that the one who is the Son of Man, the Savior of the world, he's also the judge of the world. I'm going to share some scriptures. There's a lot of them that I'm going to share, but they're really, really critical for us to kind of get our minds wrapped around this idea that this is one of the, ta- the, the duties, one of the tasks that Jesus holds in his hand, this judge of the world. James chapter 5, verse 9. Do not complain, brethren, against one another so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge uh, is standing right at the door. That's in reference to Jesus. Also in 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verse 5 but they will give account to him, Peter is talking about Jesus, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Also, you read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, in the, right, in the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Also in the book of Acts, we read in the 10th chapter, verse 42, and he ordered us to preach to the people and to solemnly, to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Also in Acts chapter 17, verse 31, we read, because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. He's talking about Jesus. And then, as I said, the apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 2 verse 16 says this will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. The fact is we're called to live our lives every single day in light of this reality. But here's the truth. God never excuses sin and he's always consistent with that ethic. Whenever we start to question whether God really hates sin, whenever we start to question whether or not God really, really hates sin, we have only to think of the cross where his son was tortured, mocked, and beaten because of sin, our sin. Revelation chapter 19. With justice, he judges makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Friends, God is serious about accountability. He cannot be anything other. God's righteous anger and his absolute judgment, they just can't be questioned. Nahum brings this prophetic book to a close and he makes it very clear. This very clear call. He wants us not to underestimate God's diligent tenacity. We read these words from Nahum chapter 3. Your shepherds are sleeping, O king of Assyria. Your nobles are lying down. Your people are scattered on the mountains, and there's no one to regather them. There is no relief for your breakdown. Your wound is is incurable. All who hear about you will clap their hands over you, for on whom has not your evil passed continually? God is relentless. He's tenacious with regard to the wound that he's about to inflict on this ancient bully, Assyria. God says the wound would be incurable, beyond restoration, 
permanent. I would bet money that if I gave you a chance, you could probably think of the bullies from your own life. If I just said, stop for a moment, think of the bullies from your own life. How much they hurt you. How much they took from you. So much so that you wanted more than anything to see them get theirs. Right? Just, just for the scales to be balanced out. When I think of the bullies from my own life, my third grade class, like the whole class, including the teacher, Miss Taylor. I, I think of the fifth grade bully, Bobby, who would, who would wait for me every day after, to, to just to beat me up. I think of the high school bully, Dave, who followed me home because he was going to beat me up. Payback loomed large in my heart and my mind once upon a time. And the Assyrian Empire was renowned in the ancient world for their incredible and sadistic cruelty that they inflicted on conquered nations. And besides massacring their enemy soldiers, Assyrians made mass deportations of the, the rulers, noblemen, functionaries, craftsmen, so that the remaining population, the remaining people, obeyed with humiliation. Enemy kings, they were beheaded. Their heads hung in trees. Cities were destroyed. Women were made slaves. And this cunning policy of the army and good administration, it maintained the Assyrian Empire for centuries. They conquered populations, made them pay heavy annual tributes. Here's another insight into Assyria that Nahum is talking about. Theirs was also a calculated policy of terror, possibly the earliest example of organized psychological warfare. In other words, friends, the Assyrian empire that Nahum is talking about here was quite possibly one of the earliest terrorist state nations. <coughs> God's tenacious. He's tenacious, I'm sorry. God's tenacious. He's serious about justice, about making things right. And that's what Nahum's talking about here. Nineveh, which is in Assyria, part of Assyria. Someone's coming to attack and scatter you. Guard your fortresses. Watch the road. Be brave. Prepare for battle. Judah and Israel are like trees with broken branches by their enemies. But the Lord... But the Lord is going to restore their power and glory. God is making it clear to the nation of Assyria, addressed as Nineveh, that you've messed with the nation of Israel. They've messed with the wrong people. And now God is going to restore their status at the expense of Assyria, the bully. How tenacious, how focused is God on the issue of justice? How much does that matter to him? He is serious enough about making things eternally right that the entire reason that Jesus, his son, came to earth is to fulfill the words that we find written by the prophet Isaiah, which show up in Luke chapter 4. God's spirit is on me, Jesus said. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor, sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and to recovery of sight of the blind, to set the burdened and the battered free, to announce this is God's year to act. He, meaning Jesus, rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the assistant and sat down. Every eye in the place was on him, intent. And then he started in. You've just heard Scripture make history. It came true just now in this place. And please don't miss how this ties in with what we read elsewhere from Micah chapter 6, God's expectation. 
God's expectation. The Lord has shown you what is good. He has told you what he requires of you. You must treat people fairly. You must love others faithfully. And you must be very careful to live the way your God wants you to. We're to be tenacious in how we treat people, God says, fairly. We are to be tenacious as well in how we love people, God says, faithfully. We are to be tenacious as well in how we live carefully. Let me wrap up this morning by giving you a little bit more background worth noting. I mentioned this earlier. There was another prophet who preached to Nineveh about 100 years before this, before this warning that Nahum gives. The people of Nineveh, they changed their ways for a while. They stayed or they put off God's hand of judgment. But now, time's up. The people of Nineveh have once again turned their back on God. And frankly, in this book, we see Nahum preaching. He's preaching about payback time now. He's saying, you're going to get yours. Nahum is also preaching a word of comfort. He's trying to ease the pain regarding this impending destruction of Nineveh. Look, striding across the mountains, a messenger bringing the latest good news, peace, a holiday. Judah, celebrate. Worship and recommit to God. No more worries about this enemy. This one is history. Close the books. And for as troubling as it sounds, it's kind of like, and now they'll get theirs. Now we'll watch them suffer. But here's where we would make a tragic mistake, a, a mistake of epic proportions. If we think that God's righteous anger, his absolute judgment, his diligent tenacity, if we think that applies only to ancient Assyria or that only the ancient nation of Judah should be moved by this prophet's words, we make a mistake. The warning is clear to us in the 21st century. God is unquestionably, without a doubt, embodied love. God is also righteous. God is just. Ask yourself, as you sit where you sit this morning, ask yourself this. Are you ready to face that God? The God who not only embodies love, but righteousness who's just and holy. The God who will have his perfect way with everything. This is the Lord Most High. Pray with me, please. God, it is a sobering word that comes to us through the prophet Nahum. Father, this is not shared to overwhelm us. Lord, to cause us to lose our confidence in our relationship with you. No, actually, Lord, the intent of this word is that we will see that you are who you say you are. You will do what you say you will do. God, you never, ever go back on your promises. You are a faithful God. We are to take comfort in that. God, at the same time, may we be people who desire to make you famous, to tell of your good deeds, so that others 
might come to know you as well. God, you do everything you say you will do. Your word lasts forever. You are the ultimate fulfiller of your promises. We are grateful for that. Fill us with your love. And may we always, in turn, be dispensers of that love to those around us. We thank you. We praise you. We surrender our lives to you. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen.